heat, cool, apply voltage, separate platens, bring the platens into contact, repeat, 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 nearly running overnight. Any faults with any systems get shown up during that test. It's passed, by the way. <laughs> um, then you have the option to either edit an existing recipe or create a new recipe. Password, as with everything else, is AML. Now, this recipe was created with an older version of the software, so we're going to get a couple of errors at the beginning. They don't actually matter. So here we have a, a sequence of steps. So a certain number of these steps, if I, sorry, if I cancel this, go to a new recipe. Recipe name, I'm just going to call it test. We have a few compulsory steps, like a skeleton recipe put in there for us. And then you have options to insert steps before or after the current step. So say, after we've started the machine up, we want to pump it down. So we can insert a step before this highlighted one. Maybe we're going to pump. Each step, you'll have a few little parameters to play with. So you can tell it to pump to an operating pressure. Here you can set the operating pressure. If you don't select that, it will just keep pumping down indefinitely. Um, sometimes you'll have options to do the next step concurrently. So if it's possible to say, if you want to separate the platens and then start heating, if it's possible to do them both at the same time, you can select that checkbox and it will perform both steps concurrently. In this list of steps, it will not allow you to select steps that the software believes to be inappropriate to put at this stage of a recipe. So it's quite user friendly. You can't really put in anything that kind of won't work, basically. So for our skeleton process, we'll pump it down to five times 10 to the minus four millibar, let's say. Then after we've pumped it, maybe we want to do a plasma step. So we can insert a step after that one First, we need to set the pressure. So, we'll set the pressure to one millibar. There's a timeout parameter, so if it fails to reach the pressure within that time, it will give you an error, and then it will either shut, give you the option to abort the process or switch to manual mode and try to recover it. So we'll give it, say, 10 minutes to reach pressure. After we've achieved the pressure, we want to do the plasma. So that's called rad step. We've got parameters there. So the time we want to run it for is say 10 minutes. Oops, what's it gone? Ten minutes. We want a voltage of 500 volts and a current of 100 milliamps. After we've done the rad step. Uh, maybe before we've done the rad step, actually, we want to ensure that the platens are fully separated. So the more separation you have between the wafers, the more efficiently the plasma can activate them both. So maybe before there, we want to put, uh, maybe set separation, set wafer separation. I think on this particular machine, the maximum separation is 28 millimeters. So yeah, we're going to achieve one millibar, set the separation to 28 millimeters, do the rad step. Then we move on to the alignment. So at this point, the software can't do that. So it will just say, it will come up with a prompt to say, do the alignment. You'll do the alignment manually. Then you get a big green tick box to say that it's done, it's aligned. And then it will bring the wafers into contact to whatever force you set here. So we can edit that step. If we want to apply a higher force, we can set the force in there. If you don't want to do alignment, say you're only bonding plain wafers and the alignment doesn't matter, then you can skip this step entirely. Bonding. 
So we can either apply some voltage to do an anodic bond, voltage and a current limit. We can set those to zero if we're doing a direct bond. And then you've got the option for the bonding time. If we deselect that, oh, I don't know why we don't get. Yeah, we can select a bonding complete. So if we're doing an anodic bond, we can tell the software that the bond has finished when the residual current decays away to a particular value. Usually we set that value to be 10% of the current limit, the maximum current. So for a four inch wafer, typically we'd use a four milliamp limit to perform the bond. We know that the bond is finished when the current decays away to 0.4 milliamps. So for this anodic bond, I'd set, I'd set this to 0.4. That's how it knows when the, bonding, when the bond is complete when the current is 0.4. Alternatively, you can just say that the bonding is complete after 15 or 20 or 25 minutes or alternatively, you can tell it the bonding is complete when 2000 millicoulombs of charge transfer has been accomplished. So there's different conditions that you can tell the software when, the, when you consider the bond to be finished. Afterwards, separate and shut down. So if we were doing an anodic bond, we would have also had to have a heating step because typically you need about 370 degrees to do an anodic bond. For a direct bond, it can be done cold just with a rad step. So I'm not actually creating a proper recipe. I'm just talking you through like the procedure. So typically what you'll do is you'll use manual mode to establish a sequence of steps that work. Then if you want to, once you've got a reliable recipe, you can use, you can sort of program these steps using this recipe builder to create a kind of a default recipe that you can use again and again in the future. Yeah, it's fairly, it's fairly intuitive. Uh, Once you know what your process steps are, it's... After the bond step, uh, mm -hmm. should we like, use this with your uh, clamp to release? Yes, it will give you a prompt to do that. So when it says separate here, it will give you a prompt to open the wafer clamp. Uh, it's uh, it is it's fairly intelligent the software it will prompt you when it knows that certain things should be done like when it, it when it knows to do the alignment or to release the wafer or whichever it will tell you to do that lastly there are some general parameters in there so heating pressure that's a pressure at which the chamber has to be below that pressure before it will allow you to start heating that's again to try and prevent internal oxidation. Um, I think that's personally a little bit too high, but the reason it will have been set high is because if, say, the chamber outgasses when you start heating, the pressure rises. If this value is set too low and the outgassing causes the pressure to rise above that limit, the heating stops and the error, sorry, the, uh, the recipe has an error and then it, it fails. Then you've got some tolerances there, some timeout parameters. So a pump down timeout, if you fail to pump down within 40 minutes, basically it means there's a problem with the pumping system. So it won't just try and pump forever, it will stop and tell you that something's wrong. You've got parameters there for wafer thicknesses. And you can control the venting for the, of the pump, but you won't need to. Yeah, so once you've created your recipe. Uh, also, if you put two steps in that kind of collide with each other that aren't really compatible, it will come up with a fault here. It will tell you that this isn't gonna work, in theory. If, if we've thought of every method by which things could not work, it will tell you what the fault is here. So a fault is something where the recipe just won't work and a warning is that maybe it's it will work, but it's possibly not the safest, not, not, the, not the brightest thing to do. So it won't, a warning, it won't prevent you from doing it. A thought it will prevent you from saving the recipe. A warning, it won't, but it's saying, maybe you should look into it again. Then you have to save the recipe. So if you've edited an existing recipe, you can just save. 
if you're saving a new or you want to give it a new name, save as. Same as with any document. Specify the name, save. I'm going to cancel that because I don't want to save this recipe as anything because it's just a dummy recipe. There we go. So there we have the software. Well, most of it of the software anyway. There's the control program. Last piece is the log file viewer. So this is just a little tool for viewing data files in a more sort of user-friendly way. So the log files are stored in a log file folder. There's a shortcut to which on the desktop here. So say so I open a data log. All we've got there is a nasty table of numbers, tab delineated. Um, you can clean a certain amount of information from this. If you do open one up, the titles of the columns, they're all tab separated so they don't line up with the actual columns themselves. So you're going to count the number of, count the headings and count the number of columns. After a while you get used to which columns are which. Columns are which. So I know that these are various pressures and those are the plant and temperatures and this is bonding voltage and current and after a while you get to learn what they are. But a far more friendly way of viewing them is to load it in this program. So say if I load the leak rate test, this is a commissioning test that I ran last night to test the, uh, the leak up rate of the chamber. Okay, so it's loaded that log file. Now we can display any of these logged parameters on either the left or the right axis. So let's say display the chamber pressure. It has plotted it, it's basically been at a low pressure all night, so you can't really see very much. You have cursors in here that we can use to sort of zoom in on zoom in on a horizontal section or zoom in on a vertical section or send back to the home screen and then you can use this to zoom in on a particular area or zoom out from a particular area. I think you've got a hand there that you can move it around with and I don't quite know what that does. Um, you've got options here to have the left or the right axis as a logarithmic scale instead of a, an absolute scale and you can convert the x-axis so at the moment the x-axis is just a, a date and time or you can change it to be an elapsed time so this is time since the process, number of seconds since the process was started and also you can view the data log file, so it will just open the file, or you can view the corresponding event log, which is the sequential file from there. So that's just a little tool that's kind of handy for diagnostics and viewing data if you need to. Also on this computer, we've got a Cronus True image, which is for backing up the hard drive. You can create an image, so if the computer has some total meltdown, you can restore a new PC using the image that this is taken. So in the factory we've taken an image just before we ship the machine, an as-shipped image. So in the worst case scenario that the computer fails totally, uh, we can send you a new computer which is configured in exactly the same way as this one was when it left the factory. So any of your data that you've saved obviously won't be on that, uh, but you'll be able to start using the machine again. So. If you want, you can use a Cronus True Image to create new backups so that you can back up all of your data and store it on a hard drive off-site, so if you've got something important. Team Viewer 3, that's for if you have some problems and you've got this, if you connect this machine to the internet, if you have problems, we will be able to use Team Viewer to remotely log in and we can have a look and try and help diagnose what the problem might be. EPOS Studio, you don't need to use, that's what we use for configuring the motors. Um, might be useful for me or Kyle to do some diagnostic tests in the future if we uh, 
come to fix something, but you only need to use it. NI Max, this is what we use to interface with the PLC controller from National Instruments. Again, you won't need to use it. Webcam, there's a little webcam mounted on the side of the chamber just under here. Um, he looks in through a, a viewport. You can see a purple glow in here when you've got a plasma running. So that will, you can look to see that the plasma is struck and that it's working. And we will use it later on for platinum leveling, which I'll talk you through at the time when we do that. We have a, an accurate means of leveling using strain gauges that are attached to little LEDs. And the, the LEDs go onto a plug, which fit into that viewport. And then the camera can see which LEDs are lit up. The LEDs correspond to these leveling positions, so we can adjust it so that all of the LEDs come on at the same time. And then we know that the platens are parallel to each other. But I'll show you that later. The documentation folder there, so there's some OEM documentation. We've got our schematics. These are our mechanical assembly drawings. And then there's some OEM documentation from Pfeiffer there as well. All the log files are stored in that folder. That is just a screenshot that I took during setup. Just worry about that. Then you've got the user manual here. So this is quite a, a beast of a document, some 350 pages long. But you can refer to it in the event that you're unsure of anything. There's some fairly detailed, good detailed instructions for most procedures in there. There is also a paper copy of it that I will give to somebody later on. Okay, I think that's probably a good point to stop for a break. Um, yeah, we'll go on to set up an operation next. And then bonding afterwards, we'll do that after lunch then. Any questions on anything to do with software before we start? You don't need to, but if you want us to look into something, if you have a problem, then it could be helpful. And also, if you want to save data files and things onto a network drive, it's kind of useful if you do, but no, it's not compulsory in any way. Thank you. No problem.